Aria Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, I think it's fair to say that the menopause space has completely turned on its head over the last few years. What was once a taboo subject is now front and centre of the conversation about women's health. One of those who has been a huge part of this discussion in Ireland is my guest this week, Dr. Deirdre Lundy. Dr. Lundy was on the podcast in 2021 and now she's back and guess what? She's written a book to help women and families all over Ireland. The name of the book is The Menopause, the Essential Guide to Managing Your Health in Midlife. And it's going to help readers learn what is going on with their bodies and take back control. Dr. Deirdre Lundy, in person, live and exclusive. <laughs> Welcome to Real Health. How are you? You're very, you're very good to have me. I feel like, you know, that kid out of the commitments in the bathtub? Well, Terry, you know, he's imagining <laughs> like I'm famous in my own mind kind of a thing now. Well, what a year and a bit you've had. Yeah, yeah or busy. two years. Crazy it's busy. Been crazy on a, on a work level, yeah. but also you have a book. Yeah. 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 And that's your fault. I know. <laughs> so, I'm very proud of that, by the way. <laughs> so after Joe Duffy really kind of you know, took up the banner and gave those lovely, lovely people who rang in uh, about menopause all that airtime, I started to get a lot of reaching out from like publishers and stuff. And I was working really hard hours and I had no intention of ever writing a book. And then I did a podcast with you and you were like, oh no, you got to write a book. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Well, you know, I think it's fair to say the whole area of menopause since, say over the course of the last two years, and the awareness of it has really, it's its topical, yeah. it's spoken about, it's discussed in homes and businesses yeah. all around the country now, where it wasn't really before, it was kind of hidden in the background, wasn't yeah. it? It's like periods, you know, like it used to be considered rude to say that word out loud in public, like who made that rule up, you know what I mean? This is an essential part of half of the population's lives, it has huge impact on their well-being, productivity, but it's rude to talk about it since when? And I agree, the menopause is exactly the same. We, you know, It's not that I want everyone to be shouting about it. I don't want anybody to feel seconded or displaced by having to reference it and, and maybe ask for help if they need it. And for women, it is, it was and is a daunting yeah. change or time be. of your life where you, yeah. and from an age perspective, and we, you know, we chat about that, which is the age profile yeah. of it. It's not something that happens when you're in your 50s or your 40s. It can happen anytime. at any time between. Now, majority of people, they're in the 40s in fairness, but still like, and, and not everybody gets really, really upheaved by it. Like some people actually negotiate it quite well and are barely affected by it. And that's great. But when it doesn't go that well for you, it's key that you know who to talk to and where to get help. Chat to me around the changes. So the last time you were on, we chatted about the physical and the possible physical changes. Yeah. But in the book, you, you chat about the mental. Well, I put a lot of my own of journey in the yeah. book just so to kind of make that. it like realistic, you know. So when I was in my earlyish 40s, hmm, say 43, 44, I started getting flushes and sweats, but not severe. And they'd come and go, which is typical of perimenopause. But out of nowhere, I don't know, was I about 45, 46? It's a bit blurry, to be honest with you. But I have all my calendars, my wall planners for the last 25 years, and I, I wrote it on the calendar. I said, got very sick at work, had to go home. First time in my career. And I, I was taking blood from this lovely girl, and I started to shake. And I thought, Jesus Christ, I'm having some kind of hypoglycemic mm-hmm. episode here. My head was throbbing. I couldn't catch my breath. It was my first anxiety attack. But I didn't know what it was. And I was sure it was some kind of organic thing. And then I, it didn't go away, and it kept coming back. And I went to my GP. I was like, what the hell? I can't be like this. I got to work. And then he was trying to help, but he didn't know for sure what was going on. I didn't know for sure what was going on. It took almost, almost the guts of two years to figure out it was part, partly to do with the hormones, you know? So I put a lot of that information. So the emotional stuff is a big part of the menopause journey for some people. And, you know... I just think it is an area where there's maybe still a little bit of shame around that you need to say to someone, I need help, I'm getting mood changes, I'm a bit ragey, a bit irritable, depressed, anxious. Um, It doesn't make you weak to ask for help. It makes you, it is a strong thing to do. Yeah. Okay. And look, of course, on a relationship level, it's a very important conversation to have with your partner, which is, I am, you know, the, the the mood changes, the emotional changes, all the things you talked about there. Yeah. As a couple, that's something you need to sit down and have it. And like this book should be read by the couple, probably. Well, as I would like to, to think it, it could give insight. The female in the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, within reason. I mean, even though your hormones might be against you when it comes to keeping a nice, even mood and temper and all the rest of it, you're not allowed, like, 
abuse people and blame your hormones. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But to get some insight as a partner, like whether it's a same-sex couple, mm -hmm. two ladies or a man and a lady where you're, you're like, the struggle is real. It's not an imagined thing. You know, you just haven't gone like nutso overnight. This is up to a point, a medical condition that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And of course, everyone experiences it differently, yeah. don't they? In terms of the symptoms that they may or may yeah. not have, or the weight gain that may yeah. or may not, and, and that's part of it. Like if it was, if it was something like really straightforward, like if you get um, ischemic heart disease, you get central chest pain, ex uh, you know, dyspnea on exertion, you get breathless on exertion. It's pretty algorithmic. Whereas there's what, like fifty, at least fifty symptoms of the menopause and perimenopause. 50. Oh, Janie, yeah, and, and, and climbing, and the yeah, list yeah. is growing. You know, <laughs> and some of them are really life altering, and some of them are relatively trivial. Mm -hmm. And how much. Uh, that how much that affects you is very personal. So someone will have a lot of self-esteem issues around tiny gain, gains in weight, whereas other people will have horrendous sleep deprivation from flush, flushes and sweats, but actually roll on mm -hmm. and take a nap and modify their lifestyle to, to cope. So everybody's journey is individual. And weight gain is, because we see it with, and have seen it with clients over the course of the last 22 years. You know. Yeah, oh. it's like, and you cannot predict it. Yeah. No. So each, even if someone is go, who goes into the menopause very fit, very lean, they may gain two stones. Through no fault of their randomly. own. Not that weight gain is everyone at end of anyone's fault. You no, know, not at all. No. But like it is known. But they eat the same, train the yeah. same, and all of a sudden they're yeah. randomly gaining body fat. Yeah, because your metabolic rate as a female, as a person with ovaries, definitely depends on the balance of hormones coming out of your ovary. And if you start to experience hormonal shift, more shift than deprivation, shift is the problem. Your re metabolic rate drops, you're eating the same level of calories, you're burning the same level of calories, you're gaining weight. Yep. You're like, what the heck is going on? You know. And when we rebalance the hormones with the HRT, you think that weight will miraculously fall it doesn't. off? Oh, no, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. So is the message for people listening in to be a bit more kind to themselves uh, and to take to look at the other aspects of health and wellness yeah. when they if they do begin to gain weight and they are one, if they are one of the the women who do gain weight through menopause it's yeah. being a bit more gentle on yourself and kind to yourself you're and you look at failure. the other stuff. it's no, not because you have no yeah. discipline you know yeah. you're supposed to enjoy eating you're supposed to exercise to a point where you're enjoying it not to make it a kind of a penance mm -hmm. you know um but it may be that in your nature, your size two is now going to be a size eight, and you're just going to have to roll with that, you know? It's different, I think, from us, from a medical point of view, when it goes, when you're getting into the obese, overweight mm -hmm. obese, because now we're worried about your health. Yes. Um, and, and of course, you can, we've seen it with, even with Operation Transformation, we've had leaders on who have been going through the menopause or post menopause, and they can lose weight. Yeah. So it, it is doable. It is doable. It just takes but it's, a lot more work. And as we would say to them when they come in, or even for the in the first health check in, which is, we don't know how this is going to go. No. We yeah. can't predict it because your menopause a, changes everything. It's a unique thing. And yeah. it's really important to say that to, to anyone listening in that menopause does, it, change, it changes the rules. Yeah. And every single person is so individual, whether yeah. they gain weight, lose weight. Weight. But yeah. the key thing is that the healthier you are going through it from the other aspects, so presumably strength, yeah. lean tissue, keeping as much of that on as you can, being as strong as you can, having balance in terms of, yeah. you know, life, work-life balance. Sarcopenia, as we call it, you mm -hmm. know, so lo losing muscle mass as opposed to just general weight is a huge part of going through menopause. And you'll see it like in your granny and your older female relations, you know, they sort of shrink a little mm. bit. Now, some of that is <laughs> osteoporosis, yeah. but a lot of that is just muscle loss. I've seen it in myself. I lost mm -hmm. a bit of weight this year, and I was like, thank you, God. But um, my skin hangs off of me like an elephant's mm -hmm. legs, whereas <laughs> it, that when I lost weight in the past, that didn't used to happen. So that's because I'm losing muscle. Yes. So I'm trying to focus on protein. I'm trying to do, um, you know, weights. I have the mini weights. But it's a, it's a daily struggle, it really is, you know. And it's important, I just think it's great, it's refreshing for someone to come on and talk about stuff like this and reassure people that it's, because as much as like, I, from a you know from a work perspective, I would bang on about it all the time to clients and say, this is normal, yeah. but actually, it's that experience piece of you've been through it, I've you've lived it, it yeah. and then you have the knowledge from, from the science and from what you do from a work perspective to say yeah. to people, this is what's happening, yeah. this is normal and just be kind, be nicer to yourself. In our service in, in the National Maternity Hospital, um, 
which, so I, I was saying to you, I left private care now, and I only work in the public system, so the only way a patient can see me is to be referred by their doctor, and we only have a small catchment. We do a couple of counties and then South County Dublin, and we focus mostly on people who have serious medical conditions that would make their choices around menopause treatments completely different, you know, so ladies who survived cancer, stuff like that, you know, and a lot of times... <laughs> they're dealing with cancer care. They've had all these menopause symptoms. They might have other um, side effects from their chemotherapy, radiotherapy, whatever. And like their main focus is their weight. Yeah. And we're, we're not sniffy about that. We're like, you're entitled to want to be a comfortable mm -hmm. weight. And we will do whatever we can to work with you to try to achieve that. But don't don't beat yourself up. Like, of course you might have ate, eaten more and exercised less. You're going through chemotherapy for the love of God. Give yourself a break. We will get there. We will yeah. get there. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. I really hope you're enjoying today's chat. A very important chat for men, women. We all need to talk about this kind of stuff, and it's great to chat about. You mentioned cancer there. The last time we were chatting, you were saying that, you know, the link, the HRT link, that there is a fear around cancer and HRT. Yeah. Chat to me a little bit about that. So one of the reasons why you're hearing loads about menopause at the moment is because for the longest time, even if someone knew these symptoms this person was having were menopause related, there was very little would... I won't say was available. There was there were treatments available, but a lot of patients were not interested in these treatments because in 2002, a study from the United States was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that seemed to imply that if you used hormone therapy to correct menopause symptoms, you got an extraordinarily high risk of getting breast cancer, which was an absolute fallacy. It wasn't true then. It isn't true now. Um, so that was a big study that took 16,000 ladies, most of them elderly, most of them in their 60s and 70s, and gave them huge doses of horse's urine hormone. I think we talked yep. about that before, which we almost never use anymore. And the main reason they were studying those ladies was to see, we know estrogen is cardioprotective. It, it's good for the heart. It's good for the circulation. They wanted to see if they could reverse heart disease in those elderly ladies, many of whom had already had a heart attack, by throwing all this horse's urine estrogen at them. That was the focus of the study. They found the answer was, yeah, but uh, uh, some of them didn't do so well in the first year, so they weren't going to do that as a population measure. But they found that there was a slight increase in the number of women presenting with breast cancer in their 60s and 70s among the ladies who used the estrogen and the progestogen. But the increase was about the same as what you see in women who drink one and a half glasses of wine a day and a, and a fraction of the increased breast cancer detection we see in women who are overweight not even obese now, just overweight. So relative to other things that people do in their lives or have in their lives, it was small change, small potatoes. But the media just lost the plot. And they were like, HRT gives you breast cancer. So I'd be meeting women in the 2000s, 2010, who had horrible symptoms, really severe need, zero risk, absolutely suitable for HRT, wouldn't touch it, wouldn't buy it, wouldn't take it, couldn't give it away. Then in 2015, the UK's National Institute of Clinical and Healthcare Excellence, NICE, said, ladies, lads, what is going on? HRT does not cause breast cancer. All these poor women are in bits. Why are you not giving them balanced information? Don't read your medical information from a headline in a paper or a journal, you know, whatever. You need to go by guidelines. And then they introduced the UK National Guidelines for Care of Menopausal Women. And and really, the the algorithm, you know, the kind of the, it's been logarithmically improving year on since 2015. And then from an Irish perspective, I think Joe Duffy was a big turning point for us. Would you agree? Yeah. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It just it brought it into the national, the national yeah. the psyche, which was fantastic. And it's not that we think, oh, every single person has to be on hormones. Mm -hmm. Not at all. We're just saying, stop, take that fear yep. away. And, and particularly important that healthcare providers don't be afraid of hormone therapy because the facts don't support that fear. And if you're nervous and you're unsure about how to proceed, what the heck are you going to be putting on to the ladies, uh, the patients who come and attend you, you know? And presumably, if it's breast cancer people are concerned about, the family history is the really important, or is it? Well, breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women mm. after skin, you know, so it is a common cancer. And 
I think our lifetime exposure to breast cancer is about one in eight. Like, that's a lot. So if you manage to live to about 100, 110, there's a good chance if you're a female you're going to get breast cancer. It is our cancer. And there are some forms of breast cancer that can be driven by hormones, not just estrogen and progesterone, other hormones, you know. Um, And it is true that if you have a very strong family history and maybe you carry a breast cancer gene, you need to be very vigilant about the possibility of you getting breast cancer. But the impact that HRT will have on that strong family history is infinitesimal compared to the huge genetic predisposition predisposition you already possess. So like, it's very much a personal choice for a lady with a strong family history, whether she would use it or not. We wouldn't ever deny anybody access to hormones because she had a strong family history. We might say, listen, you might have BRCA or one of these other cancer. You might like to maybe consider having some kind of risk-reducing surgery before you you know, explore other treatments or what have you. But if you're suffering with menopause and you want care, no one's going to deny it to you just because of a family history. But you do want to be vigilant. And certainly women who know they have a gene for breast cancer and have had breast cancer surgery, you know, they usually do Mm -hmm. prophylactic mastectomy. I think especially if they take their ovaries as well, which they often do, they should all be offered estrogen immediately. Yeah. Okay. Chat to me about menopause earlier in life and the reasons that that may happen. So the powers that be have uh, ordained that if you go through menopause, if you're experiencing menopause-related symptoms Mm -hmm. from around 45 onward, that would be normal, usual, typical. Okay, so 45 45. is kind of the... Yeah. The norm. That's the watershed. Okay. So it doesn't mean your periods will stop. You may still be having periods. But if you're starting to get flushes, sweats, mood changes, dry skin, blah, 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 one of the 50, chances are it is just menopause. And whether or not you do something about it or don't is entirely up to you because you're just a normal person going Mm -hmm. through a normal phenomenon. But if you're starting to get menopausal symptoms, and particularly if your periods are skipping under 45 and especially under 40, That's what we call premature menopause or premature ovarian failure, it was once called. Now we say premature ovarian insufficiency because failure (laughs) sounded like you were a failure. Failure is a bad choice of words. No, it was very uh, triggering. So now we say POI. So if you have uh, gappy periods and hormone symptoms Mm -hmm. and the blood test, we always do blood tests for those people, which we normally don't do blood tests for older women. If the blood tests confirm that your estrogen levels are are affected, then you are not only likely to get symptoms, some people get profound symptoms, some people are barely affected, but more importantly, your future health could be negatively impacted if you don't correct the hormonal loss. So I have patients, we run a service in Holland Street for girls with early menopause. I have patients of 17 and 18 who had maybe a lymphoma treated with radiotherapy. Their Mm -hmm. ovaries were fried, and so now no estrogen production. So menopause before 20, not not unheard of. Um, People who say we're identified as having had like a cancer gene, an ovary cancer gene or a breast cancer gene, and have elected to have their ovaries removed, obviously menopause, you know, and that can happen at any age. So, and then... Some illnesses, things like um, congenital uh, uh, phenomenon like Down syndrome, Fragile X, Turner syndrome. People um, born with these genetic um, issues often go through very, very young menopauses. And we worry for them. We worry about the quality of their bones as they get older, their heart as they get older, up to a point, their cognitive ability. So we're very keen that they have access to high quality hormone if they're eligible and if they're interested. You know, you can't You can lead a horse to water, but, you know, it's very much a personal Mm -hmm. decision. Is it fair to say, just been chatting again today, that it's about, I suppose, awareness of your body and people, women being aware of their bodies and noticing the symptoms and then talking to uh, a professional? I think we are aware of our bodies simply because, unlike your bodies, um, they're constantly changing. (laughs) Like, at any given time, you're like, oh, what time of the month is this? Like, because you've got to plan your life around that crap, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, there are ways to deal with that thankfully nowadays that many people access, some people don't. It's a personal choice again, but we have actually started to become, uh, we've have had had to become in tune with the ups mm. and the downs. And really I think menopause is just a variation of that, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> off the charts, like yeah. With 50 different uh, potential, yeah, exactly, potential exactly. symptoms, exactly. yeah. But it, you know, but it, it, it's important of women, uh, kind of any age really, to really know 
their bodies and yeah. to really know. And if they are concerned, there's no stigma around going to your GP now or getting referred into whatever uh, you know, your own, like a service like your own. Yeah. That early detection, yeah. early prevention, early help, and there's G- so many different options in terms of help available. So like it's like any profession. Some GPs are really into this stuff, mm-hmm. and some people are not that bothered, and that's absolutely fine. You got to find the right source. If you're living in an area where there's not a lot of choice in primary care, I would always push hard for family planning clinics because mm-hmm. the Dublin Well Women's Center, the IFPA, they have branches all over Dublin, but they also have them in rural areas as well. Um, they're all full of people who have expertise in women's health. So there are places you can attend. The problem, of course, is money. You know, a lot yep. of these places, your medical card, if you're blessed to have one, does not mm-hmm. get you in the door. So there is a sort of a socioeconomic filter there, and that's not fair. And, and on some level, this book that I'm supposed to be promoting, I felt bad. Like, I wanted to self-publish a book. I told yeah, you that, you and I wanted yeah. to give it out. Like, yeah, you know, post it. You wanted to put it as a leaflet. I, I did, know. yeah. Penguin listening again would not be very happy no, about No, they wouldn't, no. you know. So, like, <laughs> and it did occur to me, only lately I realized, like, a lot of the patients that I'm meeting, we see POI ladies from all over the country. Yeah. We have a, a, a catchment area for the normal menopause, but for the young girls, I'll take anybody from anywhere. Claire Island, Tori, come on to Hollis Street. Come on to the National Maternity Hospital. But um, I... Uh, just recently, I said to two ladies, um, if you have any issues and you want to talk to me or Claire, my beautiful nurse, this is our email address. Don't have a computer. Don't have an email address. Yeah. Don't have a yeah. s- yeah, smartphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. And I was like, Jesus, how do you get, yeah. how do you get mm-hmm. disseminating information mm-hmm. to people who don't have that stuff? So that I think print media still has a huge oh, role. Huge, huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for coming in. It's My been pleasure. wonderful. My and pleasure. to see in person this time is even better. We're very proud of Real <laughs> Health that this book is on the shelves because we helped get it there, which uh, we're delighted with. Remind us about the name of the book. Uh, the Menopause, The Essential Guide to Midlife Health, I think. And yeah. it's available in bookstores nationwide. Everywhere. So if you are listening in and you are intrigued or you're even a, a, as a relationship that you want, might want to buy it for your partner or something like that, it is available nationwide. Dr. Deirdre Lundy, thank you so much for joining us today. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's God. episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. You know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Instagram, realhealth.independent.ie. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next week. So long ago, Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.